Useful life. Useful life of the <laughs> landfill. So here's Mark Baffert to introduce his team and talk about stuff. Yeah, so I'll, I'll just apologize up front. I have to leave right after I um, give the introduction of these guys because it's always fun to just throw people under the bus and then take off. <laughs> but I'm Mark Spafford. I'm the general manager of the Department of Solway Services. Um, when I came there, we had some capital funding squirreled away for uh, GPS instruments, and so my initial thought, or our initial thought, was to deploy a drone, so that way we could start measuring uh, how much of the borough material that we're using out of the landfill, which we use that material to cover up the garbage every day, as well as how well we were actually placing and compacting the garbage um, at the working face every day, because as it stands now, we don't really have a way of knowing what the density is in place in like kind of a you know quasi real time and real time operating environment. So we fly the landfill once a year typically, and we're able to get a bulk density, but it's for the whole area of the landfill. It's not for the specific space that we're working in. So in the interest of trying to extend the life of the landfill, because the one thing that we sell at the landfill other than gas is airspace, and so obviously the the more dense that we can compact material into the airspace that we have available. The longer it's going to last, the more money we're going to make, and the happier everyone's going to be. Um, the other big piece that we have is that we, we're currently like a mining operation out there, and Ian and Mike can answer these questions better than I can after I take off out of here. <laughs> um, but we're basically a mining operation, so we're digging out material to develop more, you know, to develop more area of the landfill where we can put liner down and ultimately put garbage, and we're stacking up soil at another place. What, and what we're doing is we're taking that soil every day we're working, we're putting it over again the garbage every day like we're supposed to as part of our operating permit. But the way it stands now with the amount of, of, of cover material that we have at the landfill, with how long we're projecting the landfill to be open, we're gonna run out of cover material at some point before the, the life of the landfill um, is over. So what that means is we're gonna have to start paying somebody to bring in fill um, to the landfill, which is something we don't wanna do because we wanna keep our rates for disposal as low as possible. So what we're trying to do is we're, we're trying to figure out how well we're doing on a daily basis with compacting material and getting trash placed, so that way we can figure out different means that we can do to you know, change our operations. You know, maybe Ian needs to get on you know, one of the operators that's operating out there because they're not running the compactor enough or they're putting too much cover material down, all, can, all which affects our um, in-place density of the landfill. So what we wanted to do, um, instead of just buying the equipment, because what I like to do with staff is just kind of dump them in the deep end and say, hey, go ahead and figure this out. <laughs> I got talked back off the ledge on this one, and we thought it would be a better idea to try to partner um, with UAA um, and have them evaluate the usefulness of us using a drone at the landfill for these purposes. And so basically we wanted to see if we could actually do it in the first place, measure what the, the actual place density was of the waste, as well as measure how much borough material we're using. Um, but then also figure out an easy way for us to calculate those volumes because we didn't want to make it something so we had to have a professional engineer or a different firm you know, complete for us every time we wanted to do it. We wanted to make it so we could send out a tech, throw up the drone, go out and measure, or you know, fly over the sites that we're currently working in and figure out the density that way. And so that's, that was kind of the vision behind this and then these guys are gonna tell uh, you know, actually what they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. Max is with uh, UAA, Ben is with K2 Dronautics and we were talking about building a really cool 3D model of the landfill, which I think would be very beneficial for us all. So anyway, they're gonna talk about that. And then Ian is our working foreman at the landfill, so he can answer any day-to-day -day operating questions because he's the guy that really is doing all that anyway and can speak about it way better than I can. And Mike is our uh, one of our uh, engineers at the, uh, at the department and can answer uh, any technical questions that come up. So all that aside, thanks for letting us take the last spot of the day. Appreciate it, um, and sorry I have to run. But if you have any questions, ask these guys, and they'll forward whatever they can answer to me. So, appreciate the time. Bye, boss. See ya. <laughs> I'll close this. Cool. You see what we got to put up with? Yeah, man. We <laughs> <laughs> have really long meetings. <laughs> yes, ma'am? Would you just start off by telling us the volume of material in the landfill now? How so we're um, we haven't done our side on our side we haven't been doing volume analysis so maybe Max can talk about that but we've been we've for the last uh, 12 weeks we flew about 25 acres uh, with with the UAV um, and that usually takes us about 30 to 45 minutes 
Yeah, mm -hmm. just by volume, sorry, by no, volume, are you asking for like how long will it last? Not really, I'm just curious how much trash is in the landfill. How much, how much space will it have occupied? Mike, you got that yeah, one? It's, I think we have set about 17 million cubic yards. It right. sounds right, yeah. 17 cubic million yeah. yards right now. And as far as the deposition goes, it's looking like it's roughly 12,000 cubic yards per week, roughly, so. Per week? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 It, has a, it has a capacity of about 30 million, so we're, uh, we're, yeah. we're about halfway. So. Have you identified another space? Not yet. That's actually currently in the works. Um, there's been several ideas pitched. We, we occupy a unique piece of land in between the Kootenai, the corporation, and the military. Um, some of the other pieces of land that we've identified as possibilities are all military land. And so the, the red tape, let's say, is extensive. And it's a long ways out there before we're going to be done with this, so nobody's, nothing's on fire yet to <laughs> make something happen this week, you know. You burn anything? Um, not intentionally, apart from, <laughs> apart from landfill gas. Cool. Any other questions about the outset? Okay, cool. My name is Ben Kelly. Um, I own K2 Dronautics. We're, uh, I'm partnered 50 50 with my brother. We're both mechanical engineers and pilots, um, lifelong Alaskans. Um, and we're kind of uh, working in the UAV space, not doing cinematography or, or anything of that nature, but trying to fly custom sensors, trying to do analytics over areas um, faster, safer, cheaper. Um, and Max? Hi, yeah. Uh, I'm a researcher with the University of Alaska Anchorage. I just graduated with my master's in civil engineering, and I'm just trying to find my legs in the workforce right now. And I'm super stoked to be working with Ben and Nick to try and find the volume difference in the landfill. Cool, yeah, so let's just jump in. So the whole concept with this project, as Mark kind of alluded to, is um, where we exist, we do a lot of training, a lot of consulting, helping people select their technology if they want to. the life of the borrow area and the life of the volume trash pit. Um, the key to note is that we really try to utilize techniques that are conducive to a novice drone pilot. So um, when you're doing like photogrammetry work, we can spend hours out there on steep slopes, getting obliques, doing different technology kind of moves. Um, but we really wanted to do some kind of off the shelf stuff because we don't want to tie them up for six months training on something that then the tech quits and they have to do it all over again. So we were like, how far can we get with something that's purely off the shelf? So what we did is we programmed our flights at a set altitude. Um, we flew the exact same flight path um, for, for 12 weeks. So all our data sets are identical. We use ground control points. Um, the data method we used predominantly was photogrammetry. So we'll take about, I think a couple thousand photos out there overlapped. Um, and I'll show what that looks like in a second. And we process them in a specialty software. One place where we did differentiate or deviate, I should say, from the novice side is there's some online processing programs that let you plug the photos in, but they're very black box. You get no error reports, you get no confidence intervals, there's no way to mess with the data that comes out. Um, and so, as an engineer, it's just like abhorrent to me. And so, I wouldn't, I wouldn't trust that to, to anybody, and I certainly wouldn't want to sell that as a product. So we do our processing offline. Um, we can really get in tight with the point cloud, track to survey points, and adjust things as needed to reality. Um, what we, what we then can do is volume, um, and that's actually what Max has been doing across is isolating areas of, of the point cloud that we create to do addition, subtraction, and kind of measure these volumes. So addition on the fill side, subtraction of the borrow pit, and see what our change in trash is versus our change in dirt, and get an idea of what our compaction's like. So this is, this is literally just a screenshot <laughs> from the app we used. So we flew this outline blue area, and, and it's extremely boring. Everybody thinks it's very exciting. We call it mowing the lawn. We're just out there doing grids. So the little robot goes out and mows the lawn down. Um, we set it to do, um, and this is really important in photogrammetry, if you have high change areas, you want high overlap. Um, so you can imagine like if you were flying, uh, Cubs got caught in it, but you can imagine if you, were, if you were, it's all about the skew, so I'll use my arm. If you fly here and you fly here, you're not gonna see as much as you want, like if you capture those two views in the camera. But if you, the more you add, the better you can do. So we really crank up the overlap. Um, for these high over go areas and go ahead and show. So those are those are the photos we're taking at 200 feet. 
people always ask like, what's the max resolution you can get with the UAV? Well, the answer is, I mean, you can fly six inches off the ground, right? So, I mean, you'd be taking millions of photos to get overlap, but the idea is that the camera itself is only 20 megapixels, which doesn't sound that great, but at 200 feet, we're getting less than an inch per pixel of, of resolution over 20, 25 acres. Um, so it ends up being a lot of photos, as you can see, each red dot is re represents a photo. The blue crosses represent the ground control we use week to week to tie the models to a common, to a common grid. It takes about 40 minutes to run that course. Um, and we flew, we'll talk about it at the end, but we flew a couple of other, other packages and um, one of those takes about the same time, call it a half hour, and then the other one is, is really fast. It's, it's like 20 minutes. So this is an example of what comes out when we're done processing. Um, this is a 3D colorized point cloud. So each one of these represents an XYZ coordinate um, in space. Just to kind of orient you here at the, at the landfill, this is the fill area. So this is literally gar garbage, right? Um, and this is the area they're filling up. This is the borrow pit. So they take the dirt off this corner and use it as cover and compact. So we're trying to measure the, the loss of volume here compared to the creation of volume here and get that comparison um, and see where we end up. Oh, well, I'll actually go back just one, sure, one click, sorry. That is, that is a front end loader just to give an idea of scale. D9. That's a D9, right? Yeah. And then that's our truck sitting up there. So it's, it's a big area, just to give you guys a better idea, because it's hard to get scale on things. Go ahead, sorry. So again, in the interest of using off the shelf, um, we've, got, we've got some exotic stuff, but uh, we just used a Phantom. Um, this is very, actually very popular with a lot of, a lot of folks for photogrammetry work. So, um, it was great for us because it's easy to bring out and set up and it flies quick. So that was a fan three. That's a four pro. So that's the newest one. Um, and what we do is we we clear the airspace. We set up a no tan, which is a notice to airmen. Um, we go out, set the drone up, and hit play, and it goes and, and, and flies its thing. So that's what starts to lull you into this sense of, of security of like, well, this is great, right? And so next <laughs> next slide. Um, this is a this is a DSM. Oh yeah, cool, the GIF works. So like you can see the volume change over time. So this is just three weeks, we did 12, but you can see the change and the change again. You can watch the borrow pit change as well on that face, um, which is pretty cool. Uh, blue obviously lowest, or red obviously highest. So you can see the walls and see everything change over time. We obviously lay that in. We use Global Mapper um, for a lot of our processing and contour creation. Yes, ma'am? How do you deal with the UAV ha is actually really strong, um, and we don't actually care if it deviates from path. Mm -hmm. So just making sure you're totally up to snuff on that. This is that high gravel wall or the very edge of it that he was talking about right there. You can also see that this is the working face, face of the contour plot. So the contour plot uh, isn't actually what I'm utilizing for the volumetric analysis, but it is very helpful for me, and it's also helpful for others when it comes to visualization of the elevation profile at the fill pit as well as the borrow pit, and trying to get an idea of the waste deposition and how much cover has been taken from the borrow pit. When it actually comes to the process of trying to find the volumetrics and trying to calculate the volume change at the fill pit and the borrow pit, I have to do some modifications to Ben and Nick's point cloud data. Uh, so what I do is I take their point cloud data that's been isolated for the fill pit or the borrow pit, and I essentially lay a grid over it. And that grid has a predefined spacing. Uh, in this case, we've been using 25 by 25 foot spacing. However, the final product is gonna use by three by three spacing. And this is just because it's easier to use with the landfill measurements. The landfill operates in cubic feet. So it's much easier if we go ahead, or cubic yards, excuse me. So it's much easier if we have this three by three spacing uh, for the grids and the grid cells. So after laying this grid down over the point cloud data, uh, you just take an average of all the points that fall within that cell to create a new single value, and this generates a new modified point cloud. In this modified point cloud, you can then perform essentially a rough integration, right? You're essentially doing a Riemann summation beneath this surface, and then you take another surface. So for instance, this is uh, September 8th at the fill pit. Uh, you can see that this is, as it rotates around here, you'll see this is the working face, right? That correlates to this area and the fill pit contour. Uh, but what we can do is we can take the September 8th fill pit point cloud layer uh, as well as the September 15th, for instance, and find the volume difference in between them uh, just by looking at the difference between these rough integrations that we're performing. 
So it's the same process, exact same process for the borrow pit. Uh, you can see the coordinates have been selected and the boundary has been defined in the DSM. Uh, I can generate a quick contour plot to get an idea of the elevation profile. Again, blue is high, red is low. Uh, one thing that's really noticeable here that I just want to draw attention to quick is that the grade is significantly different for the borrow pit uh, compared to the fill pit. And I'll speak about that a little bit later when it comes to the data analysis, uh, but it presents a couple complications uh, once when we're looking at the volume data. And just like the fill pit, uh, I lay a grid down of the point cloud data that Ben and Nick give me, and I calculate the averages in each cell and perform a rough integration for any two layers at the borrow pit that I'm interested in to find the volume difference between the two. And you can see this low, lower shelf, which is the working face of the borrow pit that they're taking the cover from and depositing over the fill pit, and it matches nicely over with uh, the contour plot from September 8th. circled it here. And instead of showing you guys a point cloud of the volume difference, I'm just going to show you guys a contour plot of the resultant point cloud because it's going to be pretty difficult to see a 3D bottle of point clouds and understand what volume change is going on there. So this is what it looks like at the fill pit between August 24th and September 8th when we look at the volume difference. You can see that uh, this surface or the elevation has changed in the working face by as much as 15 to 17 and a half feet or 12, 12 and a half to 15 feet roughly in some spots. Just like with that layer, uh, we can perform the same for the September 8th, September 15th data. Again, I've circled the volume change here or the change in elevation profile to make it easier to see. And one thing that you're gonna notice when you look at the volume difference uh, between these two layers is that it seems like the deposition has been reduced between these two flights. There's actually a really easy explanation for that. It's because August 24th was kind of our initial test flight we actually weren't really planning on flying initially that day, right? Uh, so we didn't actually really start data collection proper until September 8th. So there were two weeks between August 24th and September 8th. And if you look at the numbers, uh, the amount of volume deposited here between September 8th and September 15th is roughly half of that between August 24th and September 8th. So that's the only reason for that change in deposition there. Similarly, uh, the same process could be done for the 15th through the 23rd. And we get a result that looks highly similar to the previous week as far as the amount of deposition goes. So one thing that's worth noting here, uh, which is really cool, is that to produce numbers that were reasonable at the fill pit is fantastic. So looking at the borrow pit and the volume changes of the borrow pit, uh, this is August 24th through September 8th now, so we're back at the beginning of that period. Uh, this is the working face for the borrow pit between those two periods. And likewise, we can calculate the volume difference between the two. And you can see where they've gouged out the cover from the borrow pit and taken it over the, to the fill pit to cover up the trash. Again, look at September 8th through September 15th. I've circled the working face where the volume changes, roughly speaking. And you'll see a similar but slightly less amount of uh, cover being taken away. Again, this is just because we're looking at a one-week interval instead of a two-week interval. I, I gotta, so, so there's the other, so your baseline data, like your, your base surface is up to two and a half feet off? Is that in, in certain areas or, or? How do you, like oh. there's the area, you see what I'm saying? Like, like what are those, what are the, what are the spots of two and a half feet difference so there's some minor variation in the data, right? Just because the data is not going to be all zeroed out in the areas where there's no volume difference, right? So in the area, if I subtract these two layers, if I'm just looking at this building and I subtract two layers, in a perfect world, it would just be zero, right? But just because of the nature of the data that we're collecting, there's going to be some minor variation. And most of this is honestly close to the zero point. It's just in the interval from zero to negative two and a half to negative two and a half. And some other, yeah, it's in that interval. And then the other thing to note is that, like, they're pushing dirt around. Like, it's not a perfect yeah. ex excavate either, right? Like, they're subpiling dirt, or there's like big gouges if they come in when it's soft. So, I mean, there's not always exactly perfect. So it's, it's funny because when you asked that, I was just looking at his data and I was like, I can see where my operators are, are getting off grade a little bit. And even right here, this stuff, I, from what you I, were I'm just saying, just... these are safety berms around our pit. Oh, okay. So we I'm have just curious because you there. know I see that and I'm like, well, where's the baseline? To, you know what I mean? Oh. It, to me, it looks like there should be some area, and, and 
you know, where if I were doing a volume calculation, I would have baseline data to go off of, and that, and I would want to see as much zero as possible, you know. Right, but again, oh, they're, sorry, not, they're not showing, you guys aren't showing any of your, your benchmarks. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just curious. I just, yeah. I, I see it and I'm like, oh, well, that's. But yeah. even, I mean, even looking at areas where there isn't any volume change or where there's no work going on, you're still going to see a little bit of fluctuation. Like, I haven't ever seen perfect volume change data at this point yet. <laughs> well, and also, like, it's what are you willing to pay for? Like, if they want to, if they want to go out and fly with the tech for 40 minutes, which is what this study's based on, then... No, I'm just, I'm just curious. Yeah. No, 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 I, I know, and I'm just trying to answer. Like, it's like any measurement you take in real life, right? Like, you can have some datum that's perfect, but, or, but there's no real life perfect measurement. I mean, even just the ground subsiding or changing or, you know, as it freezes and hardens or softens, and it's, it's always gonna be different. So I'm just trying to answer your question. I'm not being defensive about it. Just trying to explain like what's kind of what's that's going on here. So. But on the note of data, uh, I did actually wanna talk about difficulties with the data analysis for the borrow pit in particular. So I mentioned earlier that there's a larger grade, a steeper grade at the borrow pit than at the fill pit. Uh, this can cause some issues when it comes to the data collection. So there's the main area of volume change, and there is what appears to be a spire that's about 15 feet tall sticking out on the main working face of the borrow pit. So unless you guys are having some fun out at the borrow pit, I highly doubt that's actually there. It's most likely an artifact of the data. Uh, unless can, somehow you measured the loader. Because right. the, lo the loader is about 15 feet right, tall. Right, and, and that's our other question too. It could just be a loader. So in either case though, you have to correct for it, right? So you can see the spire here and the volume difference or the loader. It may be a loader, it may be an anomalous data. Uh, and if we correct for it, it's a simple matter of just isolating the bounds of the area that I'm interested in, interested in and editing those points out. And this is just to help you guys see the difference between the two as well as how much of a difference it makes to edit out that anomalous data when it comes to calculating the borrow pit volume difference. Without editing that, I would actually end up with a positive volume difference overall in this layer than a negative volume difference, just because it's so high off the ground. Can I make a note about that? Yeah, quick? totally. And that's what I was saying about the change